Developed by the Serbian studio Ebb Software, Scorn is a game that was announced all the way back in 2014. From that time, it would take nearly eight years for the game to see release. I'm Matt from Hidden Machine, and in this video, we'll discuss the game in depth, covering the nearly decade-long development period, some cut content, the gameplay, and we'll take a look at the lore and story of Scorn. There will be plenty of spoilers once we get into those last two sections of the video, but for now, let's talk about the game's development. By most accounts, Scorn was announced on November 12th of 2014. This is the date that a video titled Scorn Pre-Alpha Footage went up on the Ebb Software YouTube channel. This video was launched alongside a Kickstarter campaign for the game. However, media coverage for Scorn can be found as far back as July 2nd of 2014, which is the date that RelyOnHorror.com published an article titled Introducing Scorn, an indie game too weird for the mainstream. The article was penned by Ryan Stanford. A developer associated with the game had begun anonymously sending a series of supposedly leaked images to Stanford. This developer chose Stanford specifically because of his affinity for the horror genre. Stanford, along with a managing editor at Rely on Horror, attempted to probe the source of these images for more information, but they were only met with more images. Perplexed, Stanford brought the images to the attention of the NeoGAF forums, where users speculated on what the pictures could be. Some users suspected that the images were art from a video game, while others felt that a game so clearly influenced by the works of H.R. Giger and Zdzisław Pekczynski was too far-fetched of an idea. These images were soon captured by a reporter at WCCFTech.com, who decided to purport that they were screenshots and concept art from a new open-world horror game being developed by Bend Studio, the creators of Bubsy 3D. I knew I should have taken that left turn at Uranus! Was it something I said? What could possibly go wrong? Perhaps because of this false reporting, the developer decided to come forward to Stanford and rely on horror to reveal that the Scorn team was just looking for some raw, unfiltered impressions on their game. The team had been pitching Scorn to investors, but the resounding response was that the game was too weird, and that there was no way to properly market and monetize such a niche single-player experience. The developer also revealed that the team originally didn't intend to go public with the game until 2015, but things were getting a bit desperate and they were hoping to drum up some buzz for the project. This is all referenced in an article that mentions a few other interesting points about where Scorn was at in 2014. Ebb Software only wanted to do a Kickstarter as a last ditch effort for the game, and at the time, they were still trying to explore every other possible avenue for funding the project. The studio had created a demo in Unity 4 that took them a little under a year to make, although the team was entertaining the idea of moving to Unity 5. Several months later, in November of 2014, Ebb Software wound up resorting to a Kickstarter campaign. Three weeks later, the campaign was canceled. The Scorn Kickstarter campaign managed to pull in $4,021 from 142 backers, which was over $190,000 short of their goal. On December 3rd, 2014, the game's designer, Lubomir Peklar, posted an update to the Kickstarter page that elaborated on the campaign's cancellation. Despite their best efforts, the team couldn't secure any significant press coverage for the campaign, which made getting the word out to enough people nearly impossible. Peklar would go on to explain that he and the team were very well aware of their unorthodox approach to advertising and marketing the project. There were certain lines that Peklar didn't want to cross when it came to promoting the game. And beyond that, he felt that sharing too much about Scorn to any potential players would be completely antithetical to the point of the game. 
The post states, Decision to leave a sense of mystery about the project and not show more of the game is mine, and I stand by it. The same principle that applies to Giger's and Beskinski's paintings applies here. You are supposed to wonder what is going on and what you are going to do in this world. The whole game is designed around that idea, and a lot of gameplay elements are constructed with it in mind. Unfamiliarity with the world and not knowing how everything functions is crucial in properly experiencing the game. Pequar knew that this mentality wasn't really ideal for a Kickstarter campaign, but the campaign was seen as just one final attempt to fund the game before the team would disband and look for work elsewhere. The update closes with Pekelar saying, Scorn is dead, but even dying is an act of eroticism. Obviously, we know now that Scorn was in fact not dead. Scorn is a game that explores themes of death, birth, and transformation, and these themes are also present in the story of Scorn's development. We already know that the game died and was eventually reborn, but the game also went through some real transformations over its many years in development. The scope and presentation of the game would evolve over time, and I think it's interesting to look back at what some of the early intentions were for the game. The page for Scorn's first Kickstarter campaign states that the game was originally developed with VR in mind. This was just over a year before the Oculus Rift was released, and around five years before games like Boneworks and Half-Life Alex would be lauded for bringing VR gaming to the next level. While the campaign was focused on a PC release for Scorn, the team was open to pushing for a VR stretch goal if there were enough interest. The campaign mentions that the game's engine had shifted from Unity 4 to Unreal 4, which the team would stick with for the rest of the game's development. It also mentions that the game will contain no HUD elements. While the final release of Scorn did wind up utilizing a minimal HUD, I can't help but wonder what a totally HUD-free version of the game might have looked like. Lastly, you might have noticed that this campaign was titled Scorn Episode 1. For quite some time, the game was intended to be released as two episodes, with the second episode slated to be offered to backers for free, although the team thought that it would take several years for that to come together. In January of 2015, the campaign received another update, this time stating that Ebb Software had managed to secure funding for Scorn, and that full development would begin the following month. On June 29th of 2016, the team released a new teaser trailer, which showed significant progress on the game's presentation. On February 10th of 2017, it was announced that Ebb Software had signed a publishing deal with Humble Bundle. The graphic accompanying this announcement features the subtitle, Part 1 of 2, Dazin. Dazin is a German word that is often translated into English as existence or being there. The word is most notably associated with the German philosopher Martin Heidegger, who is often cited as one of the most influential philosophers of the 20th century, as well as one of the more controversial ones. Heidegger was a Nazi. However, Heidegger's concept of Dasein predates his associations with the Nazi party, and the philosophy itself is clearly inspired by Taoism. I personally wouldn't assume that using the word was intended to imply any Nazi associations, especially in the context of a work of art that seeks to explore the idea of existence. But given our current political climate, it's probably for the best that the word was dropped from the title. In September of 2017, a second Kickstarter campaign was launched. This campaign was successfully funded by 5,636 backers, a far cry from the 142 backers on their previous campaign. In fact, the campaign reached more than 50% of its nearly $200,000 goal in less than three days. With the combined support of Humble Bundle and thousands of backers on Kickstarter, Scorn was set to release at some point in 2018. That projected release window was off by four years, but new gameplay footage and a demo that was given to all backers helped to instill a general feeling of good faith in Ebb Software. The studio was finally beginning to find some middle ground between 
keeping the content of the game a mystery and revealing enough of it to garner support for the project. Well, Lubomir Peklar did state in an interview that his personal preference would be to keep the game almost completely shrouded up until around six months before release, what the campaign did share was successful in getting players excited about diving into the mysteries of Scorn. Updates on the game would be somewhat sporadic over the coming months, but were often accompanied by screenshots or videos documenting what the team was up to. On August 10th of 2018, it was announced that Ebb Software had signed a new deal that would allow the team to release the game as one part rather than two. In their words, they were in an excellent position to create a much better quality, fully realized game. At the time, the game was set to release in October of 2018, but with these new developments, the release would be moved to an undetermined later date. Over the course of 2018, the team behind Scorn grew from four people to over 30 people, a number which would double by the end of development. Updates on the game became more and more infrequent, which drew a lot of criticisms from backers. There were accusations of the game being a scam, and people suggesting that the team was more than capable of giving more frequent updates. However, Ebb Software maintained that frequent, trivial updates about the game's development would be just that, trivial, and giving larger updates with video previews and screenshots would not only pull precious time away from actual development of the game, but would also go against the very point of the game, which intended to put players in a completely new and alien environment. These criticisms were eventually addressed in a Kickstarter update post that was deemed by some people as hostile. Peklar actually apologized for the tone in this update. But upon reading the update for myself, as well as having read all of the years of updates and interviews he and the team had done prior to this post, I personally see it as them being frank and to the point. Even if I were to agree that it was hostile, I would also have to sympathize with the people who have stated for years that they didn't wish to give frequent updates on the project, but had shown time and time again that there was a particularly strong resilience at the heart of Ebb Software, and that the game was simply going to be in development until it was done. The update notes that it's common for bigger developers to hire other studios to create CG trailers for their games so that the devs don't have to divert resources away from finishing the game. The update also suggests that maybe if CD Projekt Red didn't push their developers to create so much marketing content for Cyberpunk 2077, that they could have put more time into fixing the game. The update also includes an interesting passage here under the header, The Problem of Hype. I'm going to read it in full. Hype can be a big problem if you need it at the beginning, but still need to work on a project for a considerable amount of time afterward. We didn't do the marketing for the market, but for the potential investors. We're going to do proper marketing close to release. Presenting the game constantly just creates a vicious cycle. Every update creates anticipation that turns into disappointment for some because the game is not out yet. We realize the frustration, but at the end of the day, we think it's better to lay low and have most people put the game out of their minds than constantly bait them. The reason we needed the hype in the beginning is rather simple. Let's imagine that we live in some magical world where, out of nowhere, you just receive all the resources for the game you want to make as a completely unproven new studio. In this magical scenario, the public wouldn't know about the game because we wouldn't announce it until six months before the release, whenever that may be. And then we just have a steady stream of marketing hype up until release. But in the reality we inhabit, nobody will even acknowledge you if they don't see the hype up front. This is why we showed the game, not some vain idea of showing off the work. And now we are stuck with the expectation to constantly feed the beast for years. We decided not to go that route, as we want to finish the game in the shortest time possible. Yes, handling the time leading up to release is really bad on our end, but as much as our financial situation has improved, we still have to dedicate resources to specific things, 
and we think that creating a good game should receive the overwhelming majority of our attention, rather than trying to constantly keep the marketing flames going. How we spent the time leading up to release should not be of consequence on the release date, only the quality of the game will. It's a strange thing, if some didn't know the game existed, they would enjoy the six months of marketing and then the game. But now, the very knowledge of its existence feels unbearable to them. Even if it turns out to be a great game, they simply won't be able to enjoy it because my god they knew about it for so long. Some people just burn out on the hype. If we released it on time and it sucked, they would forget about it in a day. This post closes by stating, and for the end, a bit of friendly advice. If lack of communication is so bothersome, just ask for a refund and be done with it. It's just a game. You can play it when it's out if you're still interested. That last statement in particular is what got the campaign in hot water. And while I can see how it would upset some people, I have to be honest, I really identify with that sentiment. I don't get upset if a game gets delayed because it's just a game. But regardless of how I feel, I can appreciate that Peklar personally apologized, and the incident resulted in the appointment of a community manager for Scorn, who spearheaded a regular series of updates through to the game's launch. These updates included brief videos highlighting different game mechanics and environments, as well as interviews with various people working on the game. In interviews, Lubomir Peklar stated that at some point in 2013, Circumstances in his life allowed him to dedicate a significant amount of time to creating Scorn, but that the idea had been with him for some time before that. It's clear that Peklar is a very passionate and driven artist, and it's rare to see games from small, inexperienced teams like Ebb Software make it all the way to the finish line. But despite the odds, Scorn was released on October 14th of 2022, one week earlier than was previously advertised. So, were those prospective investors who looked at the game all the way back in 2014 right about Scorn? Was Scorn too weird to connect with a sizable audience? Well, at the moment, the jury is kind of out on that one. There are a lot of people who found Scorn to be boring, disappointing, clunky, and in the eyes of a certain reviewer at Kotaku, sorely lacking in the amount of genitals displayed in the game. There are also a lot of people who think that the game is absolutely incredible, but many of those players are quick to note that it's a difficult game, and not strictly in terms of difficult gameplay, but more so in the sense that it's not the most immediately accessible game. And for a game that intended to be a uniquely alien experience, that shouldn't be very surprising. Scorn is definitely a divisive game, but at the time of making this video, it has a respectable 71 critic score on Metacritic, a mostly positive rating on Steam, and an impressive 4.4 out of 5 on GOG. I'd like to get into the game itself now, and if you've made it this far but haven't played Scorn, I'd suggest stopping the video and checking it out. The game can be completed in about 4-6 to six hours, and it's definitely the kind of game that is best experienced knowing as little as possible about it. For everyone else, let's talk about Scorn. I had been casually following the development of this game for a number of years. Early on, I had the impression that the game was an H.R. Giger-influenced FPS, but after seeing a more in-depth gameplay preview, narrated by Doug Bradley, I realized that it was going to be a much slower, more grim, survival horror type game. Given the relative glut of horror-influenced first-person shooters we've gotten lately, I was definitely open to something different. And if you couldn't tell by the fact that I've taken the time to make this video, I was thoroughly impressed with Scorn. The game is broken up into five distinct sections, each one offering a different balance of exploration, puzzles, and combat. 
There is a narrative in Scorn, which I'll tackle later, but first I'd like to cover just the overall gameplay. I do think that my opinion of Scorn is helped by the fact that the last two games I completed before playing Scorn were Silent Hill for the PS1 and the Resident Evil HD Remake on the PC. While I can draw a lot of comparisons to other games when looking at various aspects of Scorn, I would say that at its core, it's a game that has firm roots in the classic survival horror style that was pioneered by games like Resident Evil and Silent Hill. I think that one possible point of disconnect for players who were disappointed by Scorn might be the fact that it's a slick, modern-looking first-person game with some shooting mechanics that's paced much more like a classic third-person survival horror game. Combat is slow and methodical, and in most situations, can, and probably should, be avoided entirely. The combat is one of the most contentious parts of Scorn, and in reading reviews, I've noticed that many people who recommend the game still lament the combat to some degree. The aforementioned gameplay preview with Doug Bradley features this passage. A hidden fauna sleeps within the underbelly of the world, wanting nothing more than to be left undisturbed. The game doesn't explicitly state this to the player, but I realized pretty quickly that most enemies would wander off if I didn't engage with them or startle them. This leads me to question if enemy is even the right word to use for these creatures, as they don't inherently have any beef with our protagonist. That said, there are going to be times where you have to engage in combat, and the overall pacing and feel of that combat is definitely much more in line with something like the first Silent Hill game. And admittedly, the combat in Silent Hill is also prone to some harsh criticisms. The game features four weapons, none of which have any official names in the game. You get a sort of tool gun, a pistol, a shotgun, and a grenade launcher. Again, these weapons don't have any official names, but they're similar enough to their more traditional counterparts. They all work pretty much as you'd expect them to, and the team chose to use traditional gun sound effects for the weapons, which helps to ground the player a bit and make the combat less abstract. The tool gun is like a bolt gun, a device used in real life to stun animals before slaughtering them and it was designed in Germany in 1903 by Hugo Heiss, who was a former director of a slaughterhouse. This is the first weapon that you get in the game, and it requires you to be very close to an enemy to make contact. Furthermore, it has a tendency to quickly overheat, meaning you can only get in one or maybe two strikes before having to retreat and let the gun cool down. This weapon serves a similar role as the knives and other short-range melee weapons found in games like Resident Evil and Silent Hill. It's a relatively weak weapon that puts the player at great risk whenever it's in use, and it serves to contrast the often fleeting sense of power that a player can experience when they finally discover a shotgun or pistol in those games. While you do feel a bit more in control when you acquire some of the more powerful weapons in Scorn, ammo management can be a big part of the game, and you're going to run out of ammo very quickly if you engage in combat with every creature that you encounter. In my experience, on normal difficulty settings, the focus on conserving ammo is a much bigger part of the first Resident Evil game than it is in most of the other mainline games in the series. While you still have to strive to be accurate with your shots, ammo pickups are much more frequent in later games, to the point where in Resident Evil 4, I often found myself selling ammo to make room in my inventory. Ammo placement and management is another situation where Scorn looks more to the roots of survival horror than to the more action-oriented take on the genre that we saw in games like Dead Space and Resident Evil 4. And if players go into the game with the wrong mindset and aren't able to adjust to these subtle clues letting them know that combat is largely optional, 
they're going to have a bad time. For me, the combat in Scorn did take a little bit of getting used to, but I soon got into a good rhythm where I could avoid most encounters and make relatively quick work of the ones that I couldn't avoid. The combat culminates in a boss battle toward the end of the game, which I thought was handled pretty well. A lot of those older survival horror games had bosses that were just big bullet sponges that you needed to unload rounds into as fast as your weapons would allow. The boss fight, or boss fights toward the end of Scorn, require a bit of strategy, even if that strategy is mostly just circle strafing until you can hit the boss and its exposed weak points. While the combat here isn't going to win any awards, I don't think it detracted from the game in any way, and it felt like an appropriate companion to the puzzles in the game. Each section of Scorn contains different types of puzzles, most of which are a mix of environmental exploration and minigames. The player will often be introduced to a part of the puzzle, and then will have to explore the level and facilitate conditions that will allow the puzzle to be completed. Some puzzles are more difficult than others. There were some that I totally understood and enjoyed unraveling, and others that I just pushed through and was only able to complete them because I inadvertently happened to do things in the correct sequence, which is pretty much identical to my range of experiences with puzzles in Resident Evil and Silent Hill. Overall, I really enjoyed the general gameplay of Scorn, and for me, the experience was elevated by the fact that almost everything in the game was presented without any instructions. When a player attempts to interact with an object in a level, there are some on-screen prompts, but you don't get a little icon telling you exactly what button to press. Ultimately, these interactions only ever use one or two buttons, but that brief feeling of unfamiliarity upon first seeing a prompt like this really does help to add to the harsh and alien vibe of the game. Nearly everything in Scorn has to be figured out through context or experimentation, which sounds a bit more overwhelming than it actually is. Despite their appearances, the basic mechanics of Scorn are pretty standard stuff. You have ammo refill stations, medkits, and keycards. There's elevators, switches, and a tram ride. In many ways, Scorn plays like a game from 20 or so years ago, just with a very sleek presentation and polish that allow for a level of immersion that those older games would greatly struggle to compete with today. That immersion begins on the main menu, which seamlessly transitions into the opening animation of the game. The camera slowly zooms in on a face, which we come to realize is our own face. We wake from our slumber and crawl forward, propelled by a vision of a tower in the distance. However, it's only a mirage, and we fall from a cliff down to the assembly, a gruesome factory or recycling plant. The rest of the game sees the player making their way to that tower that we caught a glimpse of in the opening scene. While the game leaves a lot open to interpretation, some parts of the game and its story are explained in more detail in Scorn, The Art of the Game, a nearly 200-page art book 
that accompanied the deluxe edition of Scorn. The book explains that the protagonist is a humanoid creature, whose biological makeup is identical to the buildings and machinery found in the world of Scorn. That's where the assembly comes in. This facility recycles humanoids and facilitates the creation of nearly everything else that we see in the game. Every part of the body is extracted and processed in different ways. Other humanoids are incubated here and then sent to the slaughter. To progress in the game, the player must take part in this process and is given a choice to either decimate or repurpose the parts of a mold man humanoid that the player pulls from incubation. As an aside, I couldn't help but think of Oddworld Ave's Odyssey when playing through this level, and the perseverance displayed by Peklar and the Scorn team is very reminiscent of Lorne Lanning and his nearly three decades of dedication to the Oddworld series. Anyway, the assembly ends with the player flooding a room and falling unconscious, only to wake up in a sort of womb. Referring again to the art book, there appears to be two main types of humanoids in the game. Some are the mold men, which are incubated within the assembly, but others, like the protagonist, are born from the Genesis wall. Humanoids begin gestating at various points inside the wall, and when they reach a certain size, they begin to press against the wall, creating a sort of cocoon that looks like a pregnant belly. Eventually, the humanoid's growth causes the lining of this cradle to reach its breaking point, and the humanoid is propelled out of the wall, landing wherever it might land. Some humanoids spawn closer to the ground than others, and the less fortunate, or maybe more fortunate, immediately plummet to their deaths upon birth. No explanation is given on the origins of the wall or why it works this way, but I think it's very interesting to note that in the art book, this is explicitly stated as being the point of birth for the protagonist. If the player is just being born at the start of the game's second act, then what was that first act? The game opens with the protagonist seeing visions of a tower, and while the sort of surreal nature of that scene might suggest that it's a dream, I'm inclined to believe that the player dies at the end of the game's first act, and then experiences a rebirth at the start of the second act. Given a new lease on life, the player can be seen as even more determined to reach that tower. That tower is the entrance to Polis, the game's final location. Polis is a Greek word for city, and it can be defined as a city-state in ancient Greece, especially as considered in its ideal form for philosophical purposes. The idea of reaching a city in its ideal form, and whatever that promises to the protagonist, appears to be the core motivation behind the player's journey. However, in the game's second act, that journey is interrupted by the introduction of the Parasite. Parasite swoops down from the ceiling and latches onto the player, digging its hands deep into the player's stomach and latching on. The Parasite's tail then acts as what the art book describes as a sort of USB hub, allowing for all sorts of attachments to be plugged in that will arm the protagonist. The symbiotic relationship between the Parasite and the player goes through many stages. At points, the parasite digs deeper into the gut of the player, causing the player to lose health and keel over in pain. 
The parasite has tendrils that weave through the player's body, eventually reaching a point where the player is unable to use their own hands. Toward the end of the game, the player is able to remove the parasite, but that separation is only temporary. We'll touch on that again a bit later, but first, let's discuss Polis and the imagery within it a bit more. It's been said many times that the look of Scorn is influenced by the works of H.R. Giger and Zdzisław Pekszynski. In my research for this video, I found several instances of reporters and interviewers calling out the fact that press releases for Scorn didn't cite these obvious influences. While those two artists are clearly an influence on the game's art direction, there are a large number of other artists, directors, writers, philosophers, and video games that are just as influential on Scorn, and these elements are all distilled into something new that can be hard for some people to separate from the more prominent influences. While the space jockey scene in the first Alien film is a clear influence on some of the earlier sections of the game, it's in Polis that we see the architecture and environment shift into more of a psychedelic tone that recalls artists like Alex Gray. Humanoid figures are on display at various points of vivisection, looking a bit like Cenobites from the Hellraiser series or the works of Gunter von Hagens, an artist who preserved actual corpses to create some of his pieces. This area of the game features statues and murals with imagery that leans into more overt sexual themes. While the rest of the game has plenty of sphincter-like doorways, nipple-esque protrusions, and plenty of sticking your fingers into sloppy wet holes, Polis takes the relationship between sex and death and turns it into a giant fortress of Freudian imagery. It's in this area of the game that the player finally extracts the parasite from their body. However, before doing so, the parasite eviscerates the player. Weakened and mortally wounded, the player makes their way to a device found toward the center of the building. One part crucifix and one part torture rack, the protagonist's arms are locked into place. His penis is connected to a tube that sounds like it immediately begins pumping fluids from the protagonist's body, and a skeletal automaton faces the protagonist and begins hacking away at his body. Two hands plunge into the stomach, which is very reminiscent of the way that the parasite attached itself to the body. A large knife cuts through the intestines as a spinning circular saw blade opens the skull. At one end of the automaton's arms, there's an organ of some sort, which is attached to blue and red veins. That organ is then connected to the protagonist's brain and sent upward into a mass of sinewy webs and lumps. The player is then shifted into the perspective of another human-like creature called a shell, one which the protagonist had previously injected a sort of life-giving formula into, which caused a large red flower to spill out of the shell's face. Shells exist as a place for a consciousness to inhabit, and over time, these forms can evolve into creatures like the one seen at the center of this mural. This is a sort of rebirth for the player, and you can now view the decimated body you previously inhabited. The player can switch between two shells, each one possessing a pregnant belly. One shell will approach the protagonist's body, remove an arm from the automaton, attach it to themselves, and cradle the protagonist's body 
while the arm repeatedly slashes through the protagonist's stomach. The protagonist will then be carried out of that chamber and toward a walkway flanked by large statues. Before this procession can finish, perspective switches back to the protagonist, who sees the parasite looming in the distance. Tired and defenseless, the parasite is able to overtake the protagonist completely, and the game ends with the camera panning out on a shot of the protagonist and the parasite existing as one entity. While there's plenty of imagery and world building here to be analyzed, I think that the game is still a bit too new for any definitive takes on the lore. So much is left up to the player to find and define for themselves that I think it would take some real collective effort to uncover everything that this game has to offer. The art book explains that Scorn contains three key themes, all of which we've touched on here in this video. The first is physical embodiment and being, or existing in the world, Dazin. The second theme is entropy. Entropy means a lack of order or predictability, or a gradual decline into disorder. This is exemplified by the player's body decaying through the course of the game. The third theme is rebirth. Peklar states, the idea of being reborn is more potent than being born, because you change drastically and you are aware of the changes. I wanted to explore losing control over your body, so that's why the parasite exists, because it's taking control of you and all your functions. Playing Scorn with these themes in mind has the potential to reveal some new layers to certain areas of the game, and I look forward to the sort of deeper analysis that this game could receive over time. If we go back to that final scene and we look at the humanoid protagonist, engulfed by the parasite, I can't help but be reminded of the way that we found the protagonist in the opening of the game. Is the shell that the humanoid is breaking away from here the dried remains of another parasite? Could it even be the same parasite? Perhaps this is all just one endless loop. The game doesn't say, and I have a feeling that the folks at Ebb Software won't be willing to say either, but it's definitely something to ponder. So I'm in the middle of editing this video and I was looking something up on the Scorn subreddit and I saw a comment that said something along the lines of most people don't realize that the first protagonist is the parasite. And then it totally clicked that, yeah, the first protagonist is the parasite. I knew that there was some kind of death and rebirth of some sort going on there between, you know, the first act and the second act, but it totally went over my head. And there's only a few subtle clues that let you know this is what's going on. Um, one being the Genesis wall and, you know, the second protagonist being born from it. But the second clue that really I think should have been the tip off for me is that in the first act, you get the tool gun, the bulk gun. In the second act, you start out without a weapon. But as soon as you get attacked by the parasite, you have the gun. Because the parasite had the gun. What I believe happens is that at the end of that first act, the humanoid character that you're playing as, that first protagonist, I believe they become the parasite. I don't think that they were in that state the entire time, you know, otherwise it wouldn't make sense with the shadow you cast in that first act and your mobility and everything. And I really haven't had time to really deconstruct this, um, but I'm editing the video right now and I'd feel dumb if I didn't put this in there to say, ah, yes, of course, act one. You are the parasite, which leads me to, you know, question what I said before earlier in the video about reaching that tower 
being, you know, the impetus for the protagonist's actions, it's not. I don't think the protagonist themselves uh, have any agency after meeting the uh, parasite. It all makes a lot more sense knowing that, you know, the parasite, the first protagonist sees the vision of the tower, they're crawling toward it, and then they meet their, you know, demise somewhat, uh, are, are transformed in some way when they trigger the flood at the end of the first act, but they still want to reach their goal. And so they latch on to that second protagonist and carry forward. I don't have much more to say about it because I, again, haven't had time to really analyze this, but I wanted to stick it in the video. And I'm curious what you think about this. Did you notice this right away? Was this super obvious to everyone else? I didn't see anyone else discussing this aside from, you know, one comment on a subreddit that I can't even seem to find the comment uh, looking for it again now. So thanks to whoever pointed that out. Sorry, I'm not crediting you proper. And uh, let's go back to the video. Well, I personally found Scorn to be a very powerful experience. I have to say that I was surprised by how short the game is. When Scorn was originally set to be split into two parts, there were multiple instances of the team stating that the game would take between 8 and 10 hours. As development drew to a close, the expected length for the game was adjusted to 6 to 8 hours. I felt like I really took my time with Scorn, and I finished it in just about 6 hours. But the average time to complete Scorn is around 5 hours, and some players have completed it in well under 3 hours. I don't really have any issues with the game's length, but I have to wonder how this game's content was supposedly doubled while at the same time the game's projected length was significantly shortened. Perhaps the claims of the game being 8 to 10 hours long was always referring to the combined parts 1 and 2 of Scorn, and the reason that the game lost a few hours over the years is because two environments were cut from the game. These areas are shown and discussed in the game's art book, and were called the Blasted Labyrinth and the Tower. These would have appeared between an area called the Crater and Polis, meaning they would have been Acts 5 and 6 out of a 7-act game, which kinda makes it seem like the majority of what was originally going to be Episode 2 of Scorn was scrapped during development. The Blasted Labyrinth was going to be a sort of battleground for the homunculi, which are creatures that you encounter in Polis. The homunculi are artificially created humanoids made from a hallucinogenic matter that people use to reach higher states of consciousness. They're grown in jars, which is why they have this particular shape, and they can inhabit the bodies of cyborgs that they create from whatever scraps they can find, whether those scraps are pieces of machinery, weapons, or parts of corpses. The tower was a large tower, and at the top of it was a large creature, similar to the large creature found in the crater. The art book states that this area was scrapped in favor of making sure that each area of the game was distinct, and that the tower was just too similar to the crater. In addition to the scrapped levels, the art book also shows a spray gun that didn't make it into the game. A kidney-shaped sack would attach itself to the parasite's tail. Noxious fluids would pump into the sack, which would engorge and then burst, releasing what the book describes as a deadly jet of bubbling septic broth. With all of the trials and troubles that the team faced while developing Scorn, it really is impressive that the game came out as strong as it did, even if some planned areas of the game had to be dropped. This is the first game from a studio formed by what seems to have been a relatively inexperienced team. Their website states, Ebb Software has 50 full-time team members, as well as a number of freelance artists it cooperates with. However, Ebb Software finally has the support knowledge, resources, and manpower to accomplish its mission, creating a different breed of video games. 
Well, I don't know what other projects the studio has in development, I look forward to seeing what other worlds this creative team can bring to fruition. There's also the matter of the VR level stretch goal, which by all accounts is still set to release at some point. But with that, I'd like to bring this video to a close. Thank you for watching and sticking around. If you enjoyed this, please consider subscribing to Hidden Machine. We post new videos every week, and we have a huge back catalog of stuff for you to check out. We also have a Patreon for anyone who wants to support us further. If you have thoughts on Scorn, please meet me down in the comments. I'd love to discuss the game a bit further with you.